Camro's extrajudicial system, the people are represented by two separate yet equally important groups, the criminals who need new identities and the parents who facilitate them. These are their stories. And I'm Elliot Diebold. We're back, Elliot. We're back and we're doing another podcast following the Wild Boy story every single week. Um, yes, we'll be reading and reacting to each chapter of Claw on the 23-day anniversary of it coming out. Yep, uh, just when everybody thought they were rid of us, uh, we're back. Um, mm. but yeah, no, I'm excited. Uh, like, uh, I, I'm keen for this opportunity to do a podcast on a short Wild Bow serial. Mm. That's mm. going to be new ground for us. Yeah, that'll be fun. Um, yeah, so this week we're just covering the point one dot one. So if you've read ahead, like I have, if you've read the rest of the story, um, don't spoil it. You know, we're going to keep this spoiler free. Uh, we're only following it, you know, we're only doing each chapter on the 23 day anniversary. So yeah. Um, anyway, I'm kind of the experienced reader on the podcast. I've read all of the story, so it's just fun. Yeah. We're back to the old format because I'm the new reader. Um, mm. old format. I don't know, what is it? Well, yeah, no, I guess this is the new, well, anyway, I've only read the first chapter, uh, mm-hmm. and I'll only be reading the chapters for the episodes that we, we, we're doing. So up to that 23 day anniversary. So yeah. 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 Yeah, well, should we get into it? Should we talk about Claw Chapter 1, The Point 1.1, subtitled in our notes here, Mamma Mia, which is a very good subtitle worked on, Elliot. Thank you. I mean, that, that just, I couldn't, I, I was singing Mamma Mia to myself half the time. Yeah, good it. on you. It was, it's right there. Um, yeah, so we are following Mia, our protagonist, who is walking home through the smoke, uh, being judged by other mums, and also, in fairness, judging the other mums. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's just the start of the hypocrisy we're going to get to accuse Mia of in this chapter, I think. <laughs> no, um, no, no. Yeah, I, I do love this story. Like, opens, like, the opening paragraph is like, yep, the hills are on fire, there's smoke everywhere, people are just kind of walking around, acting normally while wearing, you know, those, like, really intense, like, fire masks that most of Australia will remember from January 2020. Mm. um and it's it's just like it's sort of the the story immediately hits the ground running with this like things are not okay here in cameras like yeah and it's interesting i'm trying to like you know put myself back in the mindset when i first read the story because obviously i know kind of what's going on now later yeah. on um yeah no or like a whole month ago yeah yeah but yeah like thinking back to uh, how it was a while ago how i was thinking about the story way back when i first read it all those months ago just trying to figure out what everything meant. I don't know. What do you think is going on in the world nowadays in this world of Claw, Elliot? But something I, I said during my live read of this chapter was I was like, it, it feels like this story is set in a world. Like, like I, you know that, like, the energy that the world has kind of had since the 2016 presidential election in the US and then, like, COVID kind of acted as, as a ramp for this, like, Kind of global anxiety that sometimes you 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 doom scroll the internet, you're sitting there and you're like, wow, the world's just like falling apart in front of me. Um, you, you know, you know that feeling, right? That's not yeah, just yeah, me. yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. I was gonna let you sit in it for a bit longer, yeah. but yes, I know that feeling. <laughs> um, yeah, like I guess this just felt like like this story, or this, so far in this chapter, it, like this story is just dripping with that energy. Like if you told me that this was set in 2030 in a world where Trump was re-elected and shit got even worse yeah i believe it like and, and you know obviously because we, we followed like the other story that walbo has written for the like basically the the whole rest of the time that COVID has been happening and there was no COVID in that story and there were like i was like reading this and i was like oh man all that pent up not talking about COVID anxiety feels like it's just <laughs> leaked onto the page here um yeah like Walbo said that that's not quite what it is, so I guess I'll keep reading and see if I can figure out what what exactly he's going for or, or, yeah. or like what's happening. But like, even if I'm just projecting, I was like, man, it's such a strong fertile ground to project onto because we get these news reports about fucking like police riots and shit, and yeah, and then like you know the town is surrounded by fires, which have obviously dominated like Canada, Australia, and California the last few years. Like it's just. I don't. I was reading this and I was like, man, all that like doom scroller anxiety you get about the world falling apart. Just this story is just bleeding through it. And obviously, me as a pretty fucking anxious person, so like that that doesn't help. I do think it will be very funny if the twist ends up being 
this is just one year on from Trump's re-election. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe that's a bit too silly for a yeah. while, story, but also it's just a short one. So go nuts, you know. <laughs> Subtlety is for yeah. cowards. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, um, I, I also, I just really enjoy the use of the fires in this chapter because they really work as this mm. sense of like, there's this cataclysm on the horizon. Like, yeah. As Australians, I, I'm sure we both remember that point in like January 2020, where like the sky was just black, even if you weren't near the fires, and there was yeah. just this sense of like shit is like it just it, it creates an unease, and this took me back to that a bit, and like uh, uh, this chapter even starts to use it a bit with like the smoke has created this haze, which actually seems to make it like easier for um, Carson and Mia to do their job, like it's you know like. This in this sort of smoke before the fire, everything like is clouded, and so criminals like them actually have more rope uh, with which to work. Mm. Like you know, not that I think the police are usually like sicking like police helicopters and drones and shit on them, but like it it's just easier when like there's no sky. Yeah, it is interesting to think about the sense that like I mean I guess we'll have to talk about this at some point. These are the most criminal <laughs> protagonists that we've ever had right like that's just kind of the fact explain um, one thing mia has done that's wrong so far <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like i think that's really interesting especially when we're being set up to kind of see that the world is actually really yeah has its problems like you know and and obviously fires are not like a necessarily a failing of the government or a society of the world falling apart but things about like elections being delayed yeah. or being suspicious like that's really like okay we can't have trust in our big power systems nowadays so yeah. what can we do to reclaim power for ourselves as individuals well turning to crime in quotes you know um is a way to do that and i think that's really interesting i think that's a really interesting way to potentially get us more on board with bad protagonists <laughs> Yeah, because there was all this talk of like it sounds. Oh God, I, I I need to pull up the quotes, but it, it sounds like shit's getting real intense in this neighboring city that's expanding towards cameras and that, like yeah, there's just this real sense of social and political instability, and like yeah, it, it's really interesting because if you if you're on the verge of some sort of societal collapse, which it feels like this world is. It, it, there's that weird thing where like you you turn to crime like it seems Mia and Carson have to get a leg up or whatever but you know what that's not doing that's not helping like and this is yeah. the, the fucking pale reader in me coming to the fore but like <laughs> you know, they're doing the opposite of productively helping things not get worse yes and to even potentially take that a step further we are in Mia's head right we might be in the head of somebody who thinks that they can't trust the government because of blah 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 right so yeah, I mean, for all we know, as soon as we get outside of Mia's head, potentially, if we have an interlude or just even see the world from a different perspective, it might be fine. Mia might just be <laughs> might just yeah. be anxious and doom scrolling and using that to justify a life of crime when it's <laughs> uh, actually just chill. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, well, there's no doubt Mia's fucking anxious and things probably aren't. Quite <laughs> you don't as think bad it's going to be it. that? Yeah, sure, no, sure. It, yeah, like, but no, I, I I do get what you mean. Like, I think. It's going to be really interesting to learn more about Mia and how she has justified becoming mm. this person. Like, is it really just, well, I, I mean, you know, obviously her kids are a big part of it. Um, and I, I don't know, but like, that, that's not all there is to it. Like, I, I want to talk later about like how this, like, there's this element of control that she definitely feels in this part of the job that like she yes. likes. Yes. Um, and so that that's going to kind of be, I think, the really fun thing to explore as we get more into Mia is like, at the moment, Mia's not really doing that much to try and justify who she is. <laughs> not like, you know, we're getting all these instructions to Ripley in her narration that are sort yes. of like, you know, I, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting ready to train you to do this job, but like, she has not at all addressed why. <laughs> yeah. Like, or, or, well, first of all, the vibe of a criminal "How I Met Your Mother" is very fun, but the, <laughs> like the idea of she hasn't ever justified in her head in this narration to Ripley about how to be a good criminal of like, 
here's the thing that is going to help me convince you why you should be a, a yeah, criminal, yeah. you know, which is like the biggest hurdle to overcome. And something that I'm so curious about in her and Carson's relationship. And I mm. kind of am curious about it. Anytime you have a husband and wife criminal, like, yes, who, is, who br- brings that up? You oh, know, yeah. like at what point? This has always been a fascinating thing to me is like, as somebody who like doesn't, have like a partner or you know Mm -hmm. it's like like i can't even sort of figure out how to get a normal partner and it baffles me that people with like who are like murderers like you hear about the you know like couple murder sprays and stuff and it's like yeah how do you broach it like i just i can't like how do you have the confidence in your relationship with someone to go hey by the way let's do this yeah and so her and carson like i we don't know in this chapter but they could have met at a criminal luncheon or yeah, whatever criminal, right criminal con. yeah and yeah. so that already would kind of bridge that gap but uh, assuming that they didn't who <laughs> i just want to know what that first conversation is like where they say hey maybe we and maybe i should talk to my husband about doing a murder or whatever and yeah this I mean, is so fascinating to me based on the energy in this chapter so far what happened is mia started doing it and carson just kind of just like hell yeah babe (laughs) yeah (laughs) carson really like wait there's that there's like this bit where we just after we meet him where it's like they're they're like driving in their car and and she like quickly says in 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 the narration like she's like she's lecturing him because he sent her a text after he received a text and that's Mm. like bad infosec because it's the the one thing so one person can track both and like Blah, blah blah, and I was just thinking, man, this guy must fucking love this woman if he's willing to put up with that yeah. bullshit. Like, because right. like, and it was, it's the same with the contact. Uh, I'm jumping ahead in our notes, but I'm so curious to meet this contact because I kind of feel sorry for them. It's like Mia and Carson are clearly very good at what they do, but all these codes and shit, it's just like yes. Mia is very OTT, and you know, <laughs> potentially that's to a level that is required. But it is you do it it jumps out at you how ott she is with it yes. right yeah like it, it yeah it, she's a lot and, and it's a sort of thing where like yeah carson just must think the fucking world of this woman because mm. yeah like he, he he just goes along with it and you wouldn't <laughs> if, yeah. if you weren't no. like mad well especially yeah i know again jump ahead in the notes but like we learned that ripley isn't even his so it's not like he's kind of stuck here because that's the family or whatever like he's he's signed up for this he's on board um mm. and that's fascinating yeah yeah um it is very fun something that's very fun at this in this chapter is just everything's a code and Mia's kind of explaining some yeah. of the codes to us but we're basically just like you can't take anything at face value in this chapter and that's very fun yeah, like, because when, when she gets the first text and it was like, hey, you know, um, want to, like, see if the babysitter can take care of the kids. Like, I want to go on a hike. I was thinking, it w- Mia's just been complaining about the smoke the whole time. Yeah. Who goes for a hike in this weather? And then Mia's like, yes, this was code. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That actually makes more sense. Like, like and in fact, honestly, kind of a shit code because, yeah, like. Yeah, someone it- as meticulous as Mia, <laughs> it didn't quite work, did it? Like, I mean, I guess it depends on the, the dates that this stuff catches up with them. But you imagine if somebody's, like, tracing their texts in real time, like, this fucking person in police HQ is going to get the yeah. thing that's, like, me as husband is asking you to go on a hike. And they're going to look outside and be like, nah, that's sus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so uh, Mia is anxious about her kids not getting home, so she decides to track them. She uh, has planted trackers somewhere on their person, so they and the babysitter, uh, she's able to track them. They eventually arrive home, and she gets to be a mum for a bit before Carson gets home, and they get to their real work. Yeah, and it's never addressed where these trackers are. Mm. She's just She's got trackers. I, I think the, the thing that crosses it over to that sort of comedy space for me is that uh, this Josie babysitter also has one like just like you've signed up to be a babysitter for me as kids this is just part of the collateral of that decision <laughs> is you've got a tracker somewhere on your person now yeah yeah um it, it is very fun this is like another representation of her OTTness. the scene where she takes apart the nintendo to get at the tech that <laughs> yeah. she had stashed like it's so Again, it's so over the top. I just love it. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, she hid the computer inside a game console. That can't have been the easiest way to do it. Like, it's just, she's a, she's wild. I love Mia so much. Um, 
I actually did get a little disappointed at this moment though, because like she was like, it's a console and it's modified. And like, I've done some mod chip stuff with consoles in the past and I got really excited. Like, I was like, I feel really seen. And then, you know, it was like, oh, it's just some crime shit or whatever. Um, but like for a while there, I was really excited that Mia and I shared a hobby and it was like, cause so far all of the things I, I share with me are like the anxiety and like not good things. And I was like, oh, Mia and I have a cool hobby that we share. And that was like, no, actually it's just one of her crimes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but modifying your game console could be a crime if it's piracy related. So you are kind of like a mini Mia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. We both do crimes. Yeah. You both do game console related like crimes. <laughs> Um. <laughs> yeah, she puts uh, trackers on her kids. You download pirated copies of Hogwarts Legacy. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, can we talk about how funny it is that she's like she does think to herself as she's turning this thing on? Oh, it's only meant to be for um emergencies. Yeah, um, then she's just like, this isn't really one, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Like, <laughs> it's fun that she has rules that she just breaks. <laughs> yeah, like, but it's so. Yeah, I mean. I I know this is only the first chapter. I feel like we're already like beating a dead horse into the ground, but like Mia and her anxiety is just like off the chain. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Which is fun. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know. Yeah. It, 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 there was a fun aspect to like Mia as I was reading this where it was like, when she does something hmm. and I relate to it, I can't automatically assume that that's a good sign. Like you know, in the last wild bow story we covered, particularly in the second half when you had the mo- when you had those moments where you're like yeah i really relate to one of the main characters right now it's like that's usually a good thing whereas like with me i'm like hey i do that too mm. 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 yeah that's not <laughs> oh, oh dear um <laughs> yeah and, and it's so fun having characters that reflect negative traits back at you and you're like mm, i don't know about that <laughs> But, like, for some of them, it, it's funny because I'm not sure. Like, you know, when, when me is like, being anxious, I'm almost immediately like, oh, God, yeah, I do that too. That's bad. But there were, like, a few times in this chapter where I was reading it and I was like, oh, yeah, hmm, if me is doing it too, does that mean it's a problem? <laughs> like, it's like this, like, therapy through example thing where it's just, like, now I'm, like, reading everything Mia does and even, like, what it seems good, I'm having to, like, reflect on, well, if me is doing it, it might not be good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, hey, there's a fun quote where she she's kind of talking about Carson and how she doesn't trust that he actually likes him and stuff. And she says, uh, she was the only person he showed that expression to, she hoped. <laughs> it's just such a fun quote. Um, do you think Mia has, like, key loggers on his phone slash computer or whatever? Do you think she would invade <sighs> his privacy? That's an interesting question. I think she definitely did invade his privacy when they were early in the relationship. I think based on the Mia we've met now, it's crazy to assume that for the first few years of their relationship, she wouldn't do something like that. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe she wasn't always this bad. I guess it'll be interesting to see if maybe there was like an event in Ripley's childhood that like made her worse or something, you know, like, um, but like, there's no way that the Mia of now wouldn't be bugging his phone for at least the first few years does she still do it that's kind of an interesting question carson almost gives me the vibe he wouldn't care um i don't know mm. yeah i hope not but yeah, I'm, she maybe <laughs> she wouldn't have this doubt if she had key loggers and shit on his phone she'd probably know yeah maybe but then again she's the type to know how to survive without that being a problem you know like true anything can be gotten around and she has the knowledge to know that so she would yeah. find ways to find make it possible for him to be cheating on her or whatever right it wouldn't rock my worldview if we found out that she did occasionally just check on <laughs> carson's search history you know like so let me ask you this question as somebody who's read all of this story um i'm i am interested to hear what do you think Mia's line is? Where do you think is the line that she wouldn't cross? Oh, interesting. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Hold on. Um, <laughs> if there is I, a line, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one time, like, like and, you know, I'm, I'm basically launching into the next section of the notes here. Like, there are all these sections where Mia is clearly a good mom, so maybe killing kids. In fact, no, I, you know, I, she doesn't strike me as somebody who would kill kids mm. um, on purpose. Um, mm. 
maybe that's it. I like I don't know. Like the 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 way we see her just kind of accept that they're going to kill Nathaniel at the end of this chapter suggests that like I don't know, maybe like pointless torture. I I could see her torturing for a reason. Um but like, you know, I don't think she'd do like unnecessary cruelty. Mm. Like I think Mia's cold-heartedness comes from like a place of efficiency is the vibe I get. So like She's not, you know, she's not going to be into torturing people for jollies. That said, she'd probably hand someone over to somebody who's going to torture somebody else for jollies just as long as mm. she doesn't have to watch. Yeah. Um, but, like, as long as they're paying her well. Like, she seems very kind of, I don't know if utilitarian is the right word or whatever, but, you know, it is very much like if there's a, if there's a reason for it, uh, I feel like she'll, get a, she'll let a lot of things slide. And I, I feel like mm. kid killing is probably one of the few that she wouldn't take any amount of money for. Well... Ta- yeah, take money for and let slide a different, right? Um, but interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I don't know, like, in terms of let slide, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think Mia would, like, torture someone for fun, but if somebody was paying her to ha- kidnap somebody to mm. so they could torture them for fun, I think depending on the person, I could see Mia going along with that. I don't know. Mm, interesting. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I, like, I guess, I don't know, I like, I do want to talk about these moments where Mia is like a really sh- good mom, right? Like, yeah, she she's trying. She she wants to be involved. There's that bit where she's like, oh, I want to be a mom, but I got to go do my crimes. Like, that's annoying. <laughs> um, like, I'm not like a qualified parentologist, like Megafire is. Um, but yeah, my energy so far is like she's she she seems to be a good, attentive parent when she's around. Like, um, yeah, there's, I, there's that great bit where she's commenting on how Ripley dresses. And it, it like it, the way she does it, she has this vibe like, like she's being attentive. She's sort of watching for signs and making sure things are okay. But she is very explicitly, she doesn't jump to conclusions. She, mm. she's not pushing anything. And then like, like she's like, the main thing is Ripley seems happy and she's not getting bullied. So like, whatever, like, and, and that, like, that feels really on point. I was like, that seems like a good, healthy attitude. Yeah, she she cares about Ripley and not only the way that a parent and child can have that relationship, right? Like she's yeah. looking out for her, she's like taking interests in her interests, like she's really on top of it. She's a good mum. Yeah. Like exactly. Like I you know, I mean the crime stuff isn't like cuz there's obviously all this stuff with like the the social network presence where, like, she won't let her post that video because somebody could use it to know that Josie walks them home via this certain park. And it's like, yes. Jesus Christ. Like, and I think I want to talk about that even more later. But, um, you know, it's like, I just can't help but feel that you wouldn't have to be as worried about that if you weren't, like, somewhat involved in the crime world. So, <laughs> like, that that's... Like, I feel like that's the constant through line of, like, all the traits I notice about Mia. It's this really fun duality to everything about her where it's like yes she's a really good mom but also at the same time she's kind of endangering them by doing the crime stuff that is presumably something that she's doing to protect them like like it, it's like this world of just both things are true and hypocrisy and stuff that is just everywhere in the story so far and it's really fun mm. yeah yeah it's true that her life would be a lot simpler if she wasn't a career criminal <laughs> Yeah, like, I don't think you'd need to be this paranoid if you weren't doing shit like this, you know? Yeah. So, like, yeah, she's, like, a good mom, but then also there's just that asterisk on, like, you know, I don't know that these kids are going to get through the whole story without being in danger because of it at some point, you know? Like, yes, just... yes. So, yeah, she mostly good mom, asterisks. Yeah. yeah, nice. Um, What about Josie, though? I find Josie fascinating because mm-hmm. the fucking background checks this poor teenage girl must have gone through to get the okay from Mia to watch the kids I can't imagine that was an easy process yeah (laughs) I wonder how over the top she needed to go to (laughs) and like because she couldn't you know she couldn't overtly be so over the top (laughs) it just wouldn't it would be too suspicious right yeah, but there's clearly some stuff like leaking because Josie is so apologetic that her and the kids are like ten minutes late from school in this way that is sort of like this girl knows that Mia is like a powder keg of anxiety. Yeah, <laughs> like the the way Josie was sort of like, oh, you don't have to pay me and all that. Like she she was worried. Like she seems to know that Mia is just holding in a lot of stress. And- <laughs> 
Yeah. So some of it has clearly leaked, but overall, like, yeah, I don't know. I just like Josie just seems kind of unaware, and like that must have been such a fu- like Mia must have been specifically after someone she could trust, but was also kind of an idiot. Um, <laughs> and that must have been a really fun search. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, but yeah, so Mia and Carson head to their hideout to begin the night's true work. From there, they watch their target arrive and they start to get things into place. Yeah, and it's very funny how Mia is almost calmer now that we're in the crime half of the chapter. Like, the first half of the chapter is dominated by, like, the first third of the chapter, she's by herself and it's just, like, anxiety thought central. Then she's doing this family stuff for a little bit. And that's like a different kind of anxiety because she's just like drowning in the chaos that a family is. And then now we get to the crime stuff and it like it almost just feels like Mia does like like just sort of release some tension from her shoulders a bit. And she's like, oh, cool. Now I can just sit on mm. the cu- computer and like get ready to kill a guy like, oh, you know, finally I can relax. Um, and, and, and it does feel like because she can, you know asterisk control all the variables here right like we see how fucking ridiculously thorough and crazy their setup is multiple times throughout this chapter like there are contingencies for the contingencies for the contingencies um and it's just like i guess it's funny because you know that first half of the chapter is like seeing her family it's like she can't fully control everything like she's not she's got to negotiate with ripley about the posting of the stuff and yeah um tia um I, 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 yeah i don't know yeah I, I i'm not sure how to pronounce it I mean, so tire is just like this little bundle that she can't quite control or whatever and i, I think me is a bit of a control freak and like just <laughs> no. it's funny how we see you know this chapter is like she doesn't know where the kids are and then the kids get there and she's having to negotiate stuff with ripley and she kind of has that handled but it's like you know effort and te- tears just running around like a maniac or whatever and then we cut to this part. She knows where this guy is at all times because he's always in all the cameras. There, he's following all of her instructions because she has the ability to insist that they follow all the instructions. Like, like, every, like, it's so funny. The contrast here is like when she's parenting this guy into his new identity, she gets to control all the things, and that seems to make her calmer. And it's it's just extremely funny. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's such a funny vibe. I don't know. Like, there is such an element of comedy to it, but also it's horrifying, the stuff yeah. that is being talked about. So, like, yeah, Carson is walking Nathan through what's going to happen. Mia's just kind of reflecting on how the job works. It's very fun. Like, she talks about how she has to kind of nurture these false identities so that they're ready to go <laughs> when they need them. It seems like so much fucking effort, though. Like, why even yeah. be a criminal if it's this much work? Where's the fun? The overhead on their operation seems yes. fucking insane. Yes. This scouting they do, the fact that, like, yeah, the contingencies and the contingencies. Then oh, we find like, out that the, each location, yes. like this cabin, has the rigged bathrooms. Like, that's where does she find the time? You know? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> she's made being a criminal seem boring. <laughs> I hate to say it, but her job, most of the job that we see is her doing research, her working a day job and doing kind of tricky data entry, like, you know, yep. messing with data. It's just not fun. I don't know. <laughs> I think it seems fun, but like, what? it doesn't seem worth it. Like, wait, this is, this opening chapter is a story about how she's going to earn 20 grand in one night. And I'm still like, this doesn't seem worth the effort. Yeah, you know? no. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's not really 20 grand in one night, right? Because- well yeah the exactly. cabin and the identities <laughs> and all that stuff like yeah and, yeah and like the thing is like based on what we've seen so far I, like i get the impression that most of mia's money laundering is probably happening through paying josie because it sounds like they pay josie pretty well and i assume that's the main reason josie puts up with her bullshit mm. um but like aside from that it kind of seems like yeah they're putting a lot of money into having all these cabins and stuff and like knowing mia that's like also contingencies for them like if they're in trouble now she's got places they can book it that she's comfortable with and all that and like yeah knowing her any extra money they've made from this operation if their costs haven't completely depleted all of their profits which i would be willing to believe they have yeah um like presumably all of her money is just hidden in stashes around it's the going city. into yeah 
putting poison in bathrooms <laughs> just in <laughs> case or adding cameras surely yeah but like they're really building something here right? like, like, the thing is she's put all this work in and like you can tell like this is an operation that's been running for years because they're like they're mature they've got their multiple locations with gassy bathrooms and stuff yeah. like gassy bathrooms <laughs> wait, oh, yes. wait. yeah like this is yeah, like I, I would start to think they're reaching the point where now they're going to start to make profits or whatever because they've got enough of the setup. I, I mm-hmm. hope I, it does sound like they are constantly moving locations, so maybe not. But yeah, like I, again, for me, it kind of seems like for me, this is less of a money thing and more of like a control thing. Like now she has locations, she has connections, she has stashes of money, and she can like book it and run. Like I, I think that's what it's about for her is like that that sense of control. Like she doesn't feel trapped in her life or, or trapped in cameras like this is, is the vibe i get yeah yeah but then like why 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 does she need, why does she need that i don't that's what i i'm like that's sort of the vibe i'm getting but like why <laughs> uh just an- anxiousness you know yeah i mean i guess yeah, yeah. but why like why is she so yeah anyway <laughs> yeah um I do want to like talk about this moment. So she preemptively like cyber stalks the the client Nathaniel a number of times. Like before they even find out who it is, she's picked him from like a lineup of today's crimes. Mm. Um, and, and so like obviously that pays off, but it, it's also like uh, like you know, or it pays off because she's able to intercept the call to the fucking girlfriend in one of the more psychotic things I think she does in this chapter, which is saying something. Um. Uh, but I, I also think this bit where she cyber stalks the guy and finds him via his friends from like the video game that he plays or whatever and like tracks down the rest of his online presence. Like that was a really funny payoff to the bit earlier where she's like training Ripley to be so vigilant about her online presence. Cause I was mm. like, oh, like the person Ripley is being trained to protect herself from. Is, is Mia. Mia. Yes. yes. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. People like Mia. Yeah, it's yes, so yeah, funny, exactly. isn't but, it? Like, it, it? That is that fun, it, like, there's this funny angle to, like, Mia's paranoia is all about protecting herself and protecting her kids from, like, her. Or, like, someone just, like, like the, the people who apparently scare Mia the most in the world are people who are like her. And that's fun. Mm, yeah. Like, she's, um, th- there's a lot of this chapter where she's going through all this stuff of, like, you know, the best way to protect yourself from the system is you got to spread all this stuff out enough. So even if there is someone competent, she doesn't say it, but she's clearly thinking like me, yeah. like someone competent, and vigilant, they won't have enough of the pieces or it's too hard to get all the pieces because at the end of the day, it's just their job and you know they won't put all of that in. It's like, and she's saying this while she's doing everything for this operation. Carson just seems like her fun helper sometimes this is the vibe i get but like she seems to be in control of this and like so she she is that super vigilant super competent person who's doing all the things tracking everyone like it's just it's it, she's kind of proving herself right and wrong at the same time like this is that duality stuff i'm talking about where it just it kind of feels like everything me is ro- worried about happening is like from another mia and it's like she's kind of proving that someone like a Mia can keep up because she, the primary Mia, is keeping up with this system that she's running. So like it's not, yeah, I don't know. It is just, yeah, <laughs> like I, I I find her fascinating. It's like, <laughs> what is she like? How she's like playing a game of chess against somebody as smart as her that she's not even sure exists yet. Like that's how paranoid she is, and that's hilarious yeah I don't know. <laughs> like there's probably some clever metaphor like somebody clever can probably start to tie in like how that is like a metaphor for parenting like you're preparing your kids for the world as you see it or something it's like mia is like ultra paranoid because that's like who she is and that like so she's treating the world as if everyone is as crazy as her <laughs> and that's what she's trying to like prepare ripley for whereas ripley's probably kind of normal and it's just like mum, what are you on about um i don't know yeah yeah (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah i also um i love carson and mia's energy like i guess we touched on this a little bit but they're just so comfortable together like i guess we saw that mia has those moments of doubt or whatever but like there's a real 
Naomi and Holden from the Expanse energy to the way they just seem to operate uh-huh. like a well-oiled machine. And can you put that in uh, terms uh, that maybe our <laughs> audience would understand? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I know that you get it, but in case we have any listeners who don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it, like, it's just like, like it, that's a, it, it's like a couple who don't really need to communicate stuff because they just inst- like they just know each other so well they kind of know what the other one's thinking like that sort of they're so comfortable and so used to working together as a couple that there's this like mild telepathy that goes on um mm. and i just that's i love like i love that energy so much <laughs> yeah um and there's a bit of that here like when carson first walks in the first time we see him carson like walks into the room and Mia doesn't even walk up. She just like keeps packing her bag. Mm. And like, you know, in another situation, you'd be like, oh, that's rude. But I just kind of read it as like, they're just so comfortable when it's like business time that they just don't need to worry about that shit. And I, I love, I love crap like that. Yeah. 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 I think it's, um, it's nice. It's nice to see that Mia's anxiety is that it's, least not none but at its lowest yeah. when she's around Carson it is just nice and similarly that goes both ways from what Mia seems to think yeah I I hope like so because this story so far is in third person which maybe suggests that we'll have multiple protagonists like I'm hoping we're going to have Carson chapters soon as well um mm. like I'm kind of hoping 1.2 because I think Carson was heading out the door with the gun at the end of this chapter so I'm kind of hoping 1.2 is a Carson chapter and I'm really interested to see yeah his perspective on everything especially mia like we see mia talk about how she's with carson and she's like oh i'm like ugly and he's just like amazing and everyone must think our relationship is fake um and i just can't wait to see carson's side of that equation because i have a feeling he's going to be like man she's so organized and competent and cool and i'm just like this little jokester guy who like (laughs) can shoot bullets sometimes but like she doesn't need me like like I could just see him having his own complimentary insecurities about the relationship. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I can't comment on that because it could be spoilers for the rest yeah, of the fair. story. Uh, but yeah, so unfortunately Nathaniel breaks the rules and makes a phone call. So he's not trustworthy and therefore must be executed. <laughs> yeah. If only you could do this with regular kids that you're babysitting. Am I right? Josie. Mm. Um, it's very fun that our protagonists, uh, commit a murder or try and commit a murder in the very first chapter. Like yeah. it's, attempted, it's attempted murder at this point. Well, yes. Yeah. We'll see <laughs> next chapter, whether it gets upgraded, but yeah, like it's just so different from any other wild bow protagonist. Yeah. Like I know we've got some morally gray ones, but it's just like out of the, off out of the bat immediately protect uh villainous protagonist it's great i love it yeah mia is so fun like in this chapter we see her being both a loving and anxious mum, and then also just like she just code switches to cold-blooded killer um and so like yeah she does one of the most like you said villainous things we've seen from a wild bow protagonist right here in chapter one but then also for the first half she was just a kind of like nervous mom like Mm. and and you know like i i think when i was sitting down to read this i said like you know the the blurb gave me like some spy family or mr and mrs smith energy yeah um and what i was like talking about there is very specific i love how both of those uh shows milk a lot of the a lot of value out of like the juxtaposition between family stuff and like well in in both those cases spy crime stuff yes um and like claw so far is definitely hitting that button for me right now of like there is great like uh, like we're 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 getting a lot of value out of the fact that mia goes from fun mom to just like cold-blooded killer and that that just always works it's such a fun dynamic yeah because yeah yeah she's yeah she does murders but like it's for her kids right so that's good yeah, it's uh, it's good. It's still <laughs> fine. Um, yeah. No, that, but that, yeah, this is what's fascinating about her is she's both those things in this first chapter. It's like, where do we go from there? We've already seen her <laughs> try to do a murder and be a good mom. So there's just like these two completely polar opposite ends of the spectrum she's already sitting on in this very first chapter. I can't wait yeah. to see how both of them get fucked with. Yeah. Um, and God, it's a brutal execution, isn't it? The The transition <laughs> into it is... 
The door was closed. The cabin was thoroughly theirs. At the foot of the door, a clear bag would expand, filling in the gap. In the ventilation, a capsule would fall into a container. Like, it's so clinic. It's such <laughs> clinical execution. It's so brutal. I mean, like, damn, yeah. Mia. <laughs> Yeah, Mia's fucking watching, like, the Saw movies or, like, I don't know what franchise and fucking taking notes, you know what I mean? Like, this is, this is insane. It, it's cold and it's just so, like, they were so ready for it. Um, yeah. Like, every Wildbo story has this moment where I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I never want to be on Wildbo's bad side because he's terrifying and, like, really good at gaming things out and thinking things through. Mm. And Clara set a new record for how many times a story has done that in the first fucking chapter. Like, like this <laughs> this chapter has like like ten moments where I was like, oh yeah, Wildbo could kill me and get away with it if he wanted to. I think like mm. like uh, uh, like because he's just so good at all these little details. Like, there's the um, there's the the bit where me is going through all the maps she has on her like little gaming computer, um. And like one of them is like a cycling heat map she found that local cyclists contribute to that sort of shows which roads have a lot of traffic so they know which ones are the best ones to cycle on. Mm. And she uses that to know roads that don't have many cars on it to start scouting for new locations. And that's just like one of those things where I'm like, how has Wildbo done this? Like that's so clever. Like, and there's like five of those in this chapter. And I was, yeah, just. The, the big message from this story in this chapter so far is don't fuck with Wildbo. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, do you think this is autobiographical, Elliot? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to no, do he's it. Not, That's he's, a real trick. He could. He's not if he really wanted too, to, he could. Yeah, exactly. He's not saying he does this. He's saying that he can. So yeah. be afraid. Don't fuck with him. It's a, This story is a warning. <laughs> um. <laughs> um. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I, did we already talk about the contact? Uh, I feel well, like maybe we did. It, just that oh. you think he he's he's putting up with a lot from these two. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I guess yeah. He's another character where I'm like, I can't wait to learn more about like who the contact is, what they know about him, what he knows about them. Because like, how again, much like Carson and Mia's relationship, how does this like how does that start? How did they start working with the contact and like? force all these codes down his throat like where i assume he has to keep like a book on him that explains the fuck he's meant to send me uh, in today's you know crypt cryptogram mm. um yeah i i'm very i'm very interested to learn more about yeah the wider network of of the criminal enterprise they're a part of i guess mm. yeah um yeah it'll be fun. we also learn that ripley isn't carson's mm. in this section which yeah. I thought that was super interesting, mostly because that suggests Carson is a relatively recent introduction to her life. And I guess this was feeding the response I had to your question earlier about like her bugging Carson. Like she already had Ripley at that point, seemingly for mm. at least a couple of years. Yeah. So like that changed my whole understanding of Carson getting that because I just assumed that, you know, he was like the husband. Like, I, I could have believed that it was like he had Ripley. Then they had Tear, and then Mia was like, I do crime now. And he was like, well, yes, I do too. Like, you know, yeah, whatever. But the <laughs> fact that he seemingly joined. No, he's, yeah. Yeah, like he, you know, uh, or I get, yeah, like, you know, this is a, a family that he's not necessarily got that same social pressure to stick around with or whatever. Mm -hmm. like he's the he's the step crime dad that stepped up. Like, and that's. Like, yeah, like, I mean, technically, we don't know that Tyr is his. I mean, I assume he mm. probably is, but that hasn't been confirmed. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, like, again, this is why I really want that Carson chapter, because the that ma it makes Carson so much more fascinating that he's not, like, been in the picture for over a decade. He's relatively new. Yeah. Yeah. There also is no mention of who Ripley's father actually is, which I thought was funny. Like, I, I don't like that guy's chances. Like if, <laughs> Mia, if Mia was done with you, like that guy could be six feet under. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what, what Mia's timeline is for the crimes, but yeah. Do you have any guesses I, for what happened to you know uh, Ripley's father? Do you have any thoughts on that? Honestly, he might just be like he could have just done a runner or something. Like I'm mm. trying to think like what would make Mia 
so like I, I'm constantly trying to think of what what are these things that happened in Mia's past that made her such a control freak and like yeah. so paranoid and all that and like I don't know her ex husband or you know Ripley's baby daddy yeah like booking it could could be part of that I don't know maybe maybe he got killed by the mob and that was her introduction to the crime world I, I don't know mm, interesting I kind of yeah. like the idea that it's just a bit more benign like it's not it's not some Thing. she didn't kill him and bury him or something he just like he just booked <laughs> it and mia was like i'm gonna control all the things now yeah yeah interesting interesting thoughts um yeah oh yeah sorry the other big line here um mia just casually drops in her narration quickly that she's learned english twice mm. the second time after the fall in yes capital. it's a fun reveal that this is actually a sci-fi story i think <laughs> yeah, i mean that was what I first read this, and I was like, "Is the fall like because you know takes place in the Moonfall universe? <laughs> Is that what that movie's called? Moonfall? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's that um fuck. Who's the guy who did Stargate? Who does the big shitty Armageddon movies? Oh, uh, uh, Roland Emmerich. Roland Emmerich. That's it. Um, isn't that his movie? That's it's the movie about when the moon falls to earth and crashes. To I have the earth. not heard of that, but that sounds right up my I'm alley. I'm pretty sure um, it's called Moonfall. I'm so surprised you haven't <laughs> heard of it. I quit his all of yes, his movies Moonfall. once he was it trying to called. reboot Stargate. That's so strange. Surely that should be the opposite. No, because he wanted to undo the canon of the TV show. Oh right, and just go yeah. back to the movie canon, which actually kind of sucks. Yes. Um, yeah, it's called Moonfall, so that joke was very funny. Just <laughs> okay. We can edit my big yeah. laugh to that. In I'll say it again. The fall. Easy. I didn't realize this took place in the Moonfall universe. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but no, like for real. Like Mia just drops this and then like moves on, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" And yeah, I was like, "Is this like?" Well, because, yeah, I was like, is she talking about, like, the fall of civilization or something? But I was like, I don't know why that would involve learning English again. And then also, like, it wouldn't be I learnt English twice. It would be we all learnt English twice, you know. <laughs> like, or, or, like, if it was, like, some mass thing. So, like. <laughs> we all learnt English twice. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. It just sounds like such a funny sentence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, like, so I'm kind of vibing with this just actually being, like, you know, she had a fall um, mm. and got, like, brain damage. And because I was like, oh, that's really fun because this woman's whole thing is she gives people new identities. Mm-hmm. And so, like, she maybe had to go through either that or, like, the opposite of that because if she, like, had brain damage and w- forgot English, like, did she basically completely forget everything and, like, have to, you know, like, I'm thinking of, like, like I knew a guy my he was he was my maths teacher in school actually and his wife was in an accident she was in a coma for a while and she woke up and she had lost all her memories mm. um and then you know she fell in love with one of her nurses or whatever and Oof. so they got divorced but yeah. you know it was like he would talk about how she was like a whole different person after that yeah. and like that's just such a funny mirror to this woman who gives people new <laughs> identities and new would identities. explain <laughs> like like that could explain part of why she got into this side of the crime stuff like that. Yeah. That would explain why identity is like a big thing for her. Cause if she like, I'm just imagining if she was like a 20 year old who had an accident, woke up and like had no memories and didn't know her family or anything anymore and had to like reinvent and rediscover herself. The idea of tracking identities and all that would be a big deal for her. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm hoping this is. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Like I think that yeah that would that will play off the fact that she gives people new identities as a career like a in a really fun way. Yeah, well, add it to our prediction spreadsheet, and when we do sure. Claude, the what would it be called? Fuck, grasping for claws. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah, grasping we'll, at claws. No. Yeah. Sure. Then yeah, we'll we'll look at it when we grasp at claws. Yeah. Um. Nathaniel doesn't die as quickly as we would have hoped, unfortunately. So Carson and Mia mm. have to head over there to get their hands a bit more dirty. <laughs> yeah, and like, I love Mia has this moment where it's like the one time she actually feels like sympathy or pride for this <laughs> guy is like when he, he starts to fight back and like makes his tube and survives. 
Like she has this moment where she's like, she's like, oh, the first time I've really seen any of him in myself is when he's surviving. And I was like, that's like somehow more psychotic than like, because she's like, oh, yes, I do have the empathy. Anyway, back to killing this guy. Like it's <laughs> it's so much worse. I just, I continue to love this mix of caring and psychotic she is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's very fun. It's very fun that not only do we meet our murderous protagonists, but it's not, we, we know it's not going to be a push a key to do a murder kind of thing. This is a time to get their hands bloody kind of vibe. Like they're not just able to skate by on morally dubious. They've got to actually go to a proper <laughs> murder. Yeah, it, it does seem like a big thing for Mia is that they're usually a step removed from the actual action. And unfortunately, they've reached contingency level 52, which is where they actually have to get involved. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I guess it does make sense that this wasn't just going to be a story where we get to see their crime operation running smoothly for 10 arcs, but... Um, I, I didn't necessarily think it would go off the rails this quickly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it does. I mean, it's a short story. Things will go quick. Yeah, true. True. Um, um, and this is, yeah, this is also where we finally get that reveal that she's grooming Ripley <laughs> yeah. to join the crime family, and which is a very much a fun, like, you know, we, we talked a lot about, is Mia a good mom? And it's like, yes, but also the crime. And then now she's just, she's literally marrying the two. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I get, I get wanting to prepare your kid for the world. And if you have a sick gig, like trying to get your kid, you know, like there are so many, there are so many people who've done a startup and, you know, then their kid works for them. And eventually the kid inherits the company. Like that's, you know, a nepotism story as old as time. Mm. But when, when it's a crime gig, I'm like, I don't know. It seems less like a good parenting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the end of our chapter. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the story so far, Elliot? You excited I'm, I'm for, our, into it. for our podcast on it? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, I'm keen to track the rest of this. I think, yeah, I've heard six arts or something, and I'm, I'm down for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Well, we have a few other segments that we're going to be trying out over the course of this podcast. Um, one that we're looking forward to doing is called Grasping at Claws. Do you want to introduce it, Elliot, to the uh, intro music? Yeah. But bow. Oh, wait, we already used that one. Uh, are there any other <laughs> Law and Order stings? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've never watched it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me either. Okay, pretend we did the second Law and Order sting that everyone is kind of familiar with. Mm. Um, but yeah, no. So this is grasping at claws. Is the is the section of the show where we talk about predictions from the community. Don't forget, you can submit your predictions using the form that's in the show notes down below. Um, I'll just quickly jump in. I pulled a prediction from Vice Versailles, uh, and she is predicting that Mia will have. Well, by the end of this story, Mia will have adopted four kids three of whom she did not start with, which I think is a very fun prediction because it also implies that she's already adopted one of them. Mm. Um, and I think that has to be tear just for like a, that makes less sense. So I'm kind of into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good prediction. Um, I put out a prediction from community member Kaipos uh, who said, Mia will declare one of her children an ex-child. I don't really know what, that means something to do with well, identities so, i suppose it, somebody pointed out to me in this chapter the second they get the okay to kill nathaniel mm. she starts thinking of him as the ex-client not the client <laughs> brutal um i see which again leans into this whole interesting relationship mia maybe has with identity um <clears throat> but uh yeah kipos i guess is suggesting that you know uh mia and tear might end up at odds <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I just, the, the idea of Mia being like you are no longer the child <laughs> it's just like dropping tear off at a you know grocery store somewhere you know, like go find a new home mm. yeah yeah <laughs> we'll have to see um and now we'll also bring back a favorite segment from one of our other podcasts our discussion question Elliot yeah so you can leave your answer to the discussion question in the reddit and we'll read out the answers i guess on next week's episode the answers we like we'll pick them out and stuff yeah um and our first discussion question answer is a pretty simple one mm -hmm. 
uh, did you realize that this whole episode has been an April Fool's joke before now? So mm. chuck mm. your answer in the in the Reddit thread. Yeah, I guess put your answer in the Reddit thread. We'll talk about it next week uh, when we come back for the 23-day anniversary of Claw and Order 1. Point, sorry, C- Claw 1.2. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that whole 23-day thing was really your big clue, gang. So if you... <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't get it uh you know anyway um but yeah uh, before we go for real throw wabo some money if you can like mm-hmm. plug his patreon at patreon.com forward slash wabo he's had to set up a new wordpress site for this he's also had to set up the backup wordpress site mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. the backup to the backup yep. you know it all involves two-factor authentication or authentication authentication yeah. i can't say authentication tonight <laughs> um yeah this is why this is why we're plugging his patreon and not ours <laughs> um yeah and don't forget to uh, rate this show on iTunes. <laughs> I thought when I deleted that you wouldn't do it, but <laughs> I should know by now that that won't stop you. Won't stop me, mate. <laughs> okay. Bum, bum. See you, everybody. Do, do, do. <laughs>